This is the companion video to my article on using Benford's Law to detect journal entry irregularities. We start off with talking about Frank Benford, who was a physicist at the GE Research Laboratories in Schenectady, New York, and he conducted a study in which he analyzed 20 lists of numbers with over 20,000 records, and he counted how many times each number started with a digit 1, 2, 3, and the like. And his final result showed that about 30.6% of the numbers started with the first digit 1, 18.5% started with a first digit 2. That means nearly half of the numbers started with first digits 1 or 2. He then did some integral calculus and came up with what we've now grown to know as Benford's Law. And under Benford's Law, I expect 30.1% of the numbers to start with a 1, I expect 17.6% to start with a 2, and the poor old 9 only expected as a first digit 4.5% of the time. 0 cannot be a first digit, um, and so in this case, the first digit here would be the 7 and the 6 and so on. 0 can be a second digit, and for the second digits, it is less skewed. We go from 12% down to 8.5%. Would all sets of data follow Benford's Law? No. My data needs to be describing the size of facts or events, and in accounting data, we are usually talking about dollar amounts or quantities, so we're good over there. Number two, a minimum of zero is acceptable. Uh, labels, social security numbers, highway numbers, bank account numbers uh, should not follow Benford's law. And this is rather technical, but what we care about here for our journal entries is that we have a mixture of distributions. We don't have any type of journal entry dominating the data. Uh, an extract, accounting and finance data sets generally do conform to Benford. The focus here was on the implications, but I had to start by looking at the digit patterns in the numbers in financial accounting textbooks. I had a rather large sample, over 100,000 numbers from various financial accounting textbooks hand collected, and the question to start off uh, the ball rolling was whether these conformed to Benford's Law. The results here show that the first digits are very close. The first digits go from 1 to 9. The line is Benford's Law, 30.1, 17.6, down to 4.5%. And the height of the bar shows the actual proportion. And we can see that for a number of these, the 9, the 8, the 2, and the 1, the actual and the expected are nearly spot on. So if I only looked at the first digits, I would say the data conforms to Benford's Law. However, when I look at the second digits, I can see a huge excess of second digit zeros and I can see an excess of second digit fives, something that is hidden if I only look at the first digits. When I do the number duplication test, I can see that the numbers that are favored in the accounting textbooks are round numbers. Uh, we can see a 1, 0, 2, 0, 5, 0, all as first digits. The way I get around this is if I analyze the first two digits, which go from one zero up to double nine, and the expected proportions go from 4.1% to just under a half percent, if I analyze the first two digits, I can see the excess at one zero, two zero, three zero, four zero. And this tells me <clears throat> that the numbers in accounting textbooks do not conform to Benford's law. Let's move on to the health south fraud, because we care about below the testing threshold journal entries. Health south overstated their assets, overstated their assets by approximately $2.7 billion, including overstated cash by $370 million. How did they do this? Fortunately, Weston Smith published an article saying how they exactly did it. And we have a few things which are noteworthy over here. The first one is that the journal entries, the fraudulent journal entries, were kept below 5,000, which was what they knew to be the auditor's testing threshold, kept below 5,000. At the end of this repeated exercise, 
126,000 fraudulent journal entries quarterly, meaning over half a million journal entries, fraudulent journal entries, per year. How could we detect this using Benford's Law? Well, here's an example. This is a population of journal entries, um, approximately 493,000 records, and it's a little bit messy. I can see the excess here at 5-0. And what I did was I simulated Western Smith's fraud. I added about 10%, around 50,000 numbers, all from 2,000 to 4,999, added the fraudulent journal entries, just as he would have done. And what we can see is we now see that we have lots of overs over here. We have unders over here and unders over there. The extra 2,000 to 4,999 uh, numbers impacted this range in the graph. I then added more numbers, in which case the excess became even more blatant. And so the question was, how can I sort of detect this statistically, even without looking at the graph? What would tell me that I have this pattern? This is a random sample of 5,000 numbers from a data set that conforms perfectly to Benford's law. We can see the fit is not perfect, but what I want you to notice is that the unders, there are two unders, there are two overs, under, over, under, under, over. The unders and overs are randomly distributed around this Benford's law line. I created these words, valley to describe a range where I'm mostly under, ridge to describe a range where I'm mostly over. And so here we have it again. A ridge, actual proportions mostly over, valley, actual proportions mostly under, shown over there, and a run. A run, a series of successive overs or a series of successive unders. Two overs there, and five unders there, three overs, three unders. A run could be a single over or a single under. Here's another example. And to cut a long story short, this was an analysis done a while back where we had the odd lot premium. And we tend to favor numbers beginning with one zero, two zero, three zero, four zero, and the like and our natural tendency to use these numbers in accounting and finance means that we somehow impact the number of runs and we reduce the number of runs in the data. How many runs do I expect? This is the expectation, expected number of runs. This is the standard deviation of the number of runs. Plugging the correct numbers into this formula means that I expect 46 runs if the data is random. We tend to like the 10, 20, 30, 40 and the like, so I'm going to reduce that to 43 runs is what we would expect in accounting data. Looking using the standard deviation, that's the variance actually, using the standard deviation, the concept of critical values over here, as uh, number of standard deviations, I calculated that there is only a 5% chance of fewer than 35 runs if the data is randomly distributed. One thing we would test is do we have fewer 35 or fewer runs? If we do, we might have a threshold in the works. Final notes, this is uh, interest expense numbers. And in general, mortgages are of a certain size or larger. We don't have small mortgages for $403. There is a threshold operating in these numbers. And the point I want to make is just because there's threshold does not mean there's fraud. Sometimes there are valid reasons for thresholds. Number two, I have very few runs in this data. However, because it is so close to Benford, I'm not expecting any below the journal entry testing uh, fraud over here. It's too close. These uh, excesses over here are just too slight. The next application is using Benford's Law in risk assessment procedures, audit planning, and the focus here is on the unusual transactions and events. However, 
in fairness, we're not so much concerned with unusual transactions as unusual duplications. This is my data. It's accounts payable data. It's valid data. Uh, about 190,000 records, about $500 million. I'm going to run Benford's Law, and this is what I find. A huge excess at 5, 0, 10, 11, 98, 99, and a few over there, 90, and it looks like 92. I'm looking for unusual duplications. How unusual is unusual? Well, I need to determine whether this spike is worth investigating. I created a threshold line, and this goes back to my 1997 publication using the Z statistic and using what is called the upper bound over here. When the number of records n increases, this answer, the upper bound, as n increases, it will decrease and get flatter and flatter. When I divide by n, the larger n, the smaller the answer will be. I worked around that, and what we have now is what we call the threshold line. And there we have an example over here of an up, the same upper bound, and this is a random sample of 5,000 records, and yet we can see one, uh, we have a spike at, it looks like, 46 or 47. After much deep thought, I came up with the following. 5,000 transactions or more. If you use it for less, you should expect more spikes. Analyze the four largest spikes, and to uh, return back here, a spike is where the actual proportion is above this threshold line. You can see we have seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven above. In this graph, my suggestion, analyze the four largest spikes. This is the optimal balance between too little work, because we could have a spike due to random fluctuation, and too much work, which is costly. If there are more than 10 spikes, should the data have followed Benford's law in the first place? Here is another example. The company was self-insured. These are the claims, the health insurance claims that they paid out. Weak controls, a lot of trust. Because of the size issue, the internal auditors deleted all claims below $1,500 and then proceeded to analyze the data to see whether it conformed to Benford's law. And what we have here is a complete mess because we do have a threshold operating, 1500, and if you remember in the previous slide, no built-in maximum or minimum, and here we have a built-in minimum of 1500. Are a huge number of spikes all cruising around there and one over there. We have indeed 16 spikes, and now the conclusion is reevaluate whether it should have conformed to Benford's law in the first place. The answer here is no. Let's go and do the Excel demo, which concerns itself with how exactly are we going to analyze this data. Bring this across. This is the Benford's Law and the Runs Test template. This is the uh, data that we have just looked at. All I need to do is copy. These are the amounts. Go back. Paste. Read this. The most important thing is copy the formula all the way down. Get the plus sign, a swift left, a double click. The formula has been copied down. Click on the first two digits graph, just like in the article. Click on the tables. Does the data conform to Benford's law? The conformity conclusion is non-conformity. And for that, the mean absolute deviation test, um, page 114, and I will include the link. The data does not conform, and you can see it is rather messy. The first two-digit test, this is the table. The first two digits go from 10 all the way down to 99. This is the count. I counted 10,673 numbers, starting with one zero. The actual proportion is the count divided by the number of records 
actual proportion 0 0.056, the benefit proportion 0 0.041, the difference 0 0.015, the Z is calculated over here and you can see it takes a little bit of work in Excel. The four largest Z's are displayed in this column and you can see we go 98, 10 and 11. The number of runs is not that relevant to this application, but it is below 35. I have seven spikes in total. If I had more than 10, the conclusion here would come up, uh, reevaluate. I can see the biggest spike is at 50. What would I in fact do with this information? This is the data. I would go and now calculate the first two digits, and I can do that by simply using this formula again, it works, it's correct. Go back, put it into my data. First two, paste. I will now filter and extract all the records beginning with five zero. It will be a number filter, not select all, but select the five zeros. There we go, okay. Now I will sort the data. Data sort, custom sort, I would then sort it by vendor number, it doesn't matter, smallest to largest, and we're good. I can see some large transactions here. I can see a whole range of transactions exactly equal to half a million. I would look at these to see what they are about. They are probably accruals or estimates of some sort. This is not what's causing the spike, it is the thousands of transactions for $50. And if we scroll down, we see 50 upon 50 upon 50 upon 50 with different vendor numbers. The final result here was that these were refunds to customers. There was a spike at 99 and 98 as well. I already extracted all the numbers, beginning with 98, and I saw that we had a large duplication of 988.35. Again, extract all the 988.35s, look at the invoice number, look at the vendor number, and we can see a group there. And now, for this particular vendor, I have lots of 988.35s. And when we go further down, we can see another vendor popping on the scene with lots of 98835s. And for this application, I'm looking at the unusual duplications. What was this all about? I'm closing out of here. Then next application, the same spreadsheet. And now I'm going to look at my figure 2B data. This is the data. We will highlight the data. It is in cell C2, and again, it's a matter of copy, paste, copy to the bottom, there we go. First two digit graph, we can see not that many spikes, but we have this large uh, ridge over here, back to the tables, non-conformity, that is messy, runs 11, indicating we do have this ridge valley combination. The number of spikes, actually only four, but in this case, we are interested in the runs. 11 runs, how would I now identify what is happening in the data? In other words, all these extra 2000s to the um, 4999, here it is. I'm now going to do a histogram, and a histogram looks at numbers, it counts the numbers in the various ranges, and I'm going to look at the data, including all the fraudulent numbers, and if I go here, the fraudulent numbers are the ones going all the way to 592, 346, 592, 346, and this is the count if formula. And what it is doing, it is saying count if, in this complete, all the data, if in this range the number is greater than or equal to that, greater than that, or less than this. So greater than H2, less than or equal to H3.
copy it all the way down. I have the graph over here. I've graphed these numbers and we can see what's happening over here. Let me go and change the x-axis, select data, edit, and we will go from here to here and we'll do OK. This is the count for the $500 up to here, the count for the $500 up to here, the count for the $500 up to there. We can see the huge increase. Then we see a sharp drop off. And this is telling me that these counts are highly inflated and they are inflated by numbers from exactly 2000 to 4999. I'm going to show what the graph would look like for the data without the fraud numbers and histograms should normally be smooth. The fraudulent data goes to 592, but the good data goes all the way to 493, 622. 493, 622. Remember, I just added the uh, fake journal entries just like uh, HealthSouth did. 493, 622. This is the authentic journal entry data. You can see it's monotonically decreasing. This is what a neat histogram would look like. What we just saw was highly untidy histogram. The mean absolute deviation, everything you wanted to know about the Z statistic used over here to get the, large, the four largest. Um, everything you wanted to know about the Z statistic is indeed there. Everything you want to know about a histogram is here, and that histogram should have been smooth like that. Instead, it turned out to be, if we just change this to 592.346, we've got that. It is showing the huge excess in this range, and this was exactly the journal ent uh, entry uh, testing threshold, and the numbers coming in just below that.